Hello everyone, welcome to learn from the legends. Today we have a very important uh, speaker as well as the topic. We all know this is the era of evidence based medicine and we have none other than Professor Roger Saul to discuss uh, about the evidence behind uh, chronic lung disease of prematurity. Dr. Saul is the as well as Professor of Neonatology at the University of Vermont Lamar College of Medicine and he is the Vice President of Vermont Oxford Network. He is also the Director of Network Clinical Trials and Follow-up. Dr. Saul, we all know, he is an authority in evidence-based medicine and randomized clinical trials. That's why we are, so, we are so happy to have him here today. He is a coordinating editor of Cochrane Neonatal, part of the Cochrane collaboration and author of author of author of many other Cochrane reviews of surfactant therapy. He is the author of numerous peer-reviewed articles and book chapters on the subject of surfactant replacement therapy and evidence-based medicine. A native of New York City, Dr. Saul graduated from Cornell University with a degree of genetics and history of science in 1975. He received his MD degree from the University of Health Sciences Chicago Medical School in 1978. He returned to New York City to complete his residency training in pediatrics at the Beale Hospital New York University Medical Center in 1981. After two years with public health service, Dr. Saul returned to academic training. He completed the postgraduate fellowship in neonatal perinatal medicine at University of Vermont in 1983 and was uh, has remained in Vermont ever since. When otherwise Unoccupied, he resides in Heinsberg, Vermont with his wife, Roberta, with and the occasional company of his two sons. So, Professor Zoll, we are very uh, fortunate to have you here with us today. Now, uh, we will be play. Professor Zoll is with us, but we will be prayed, praying, uh, playing the recorded video of his talk, following which he will be taking the question answer live. So, here we go. I'm Roger Saul. It's a pleasure to come to you today to talk about bronchopulmonary dysplasia and the evidence for best practice. As a matter of disclosure, I am the Vice President of the Vermont Oxford Network and the coordinating editor of Cochrane Neonatal, and much of the material I'll be talking about today will come from those two sources. But otherwise, I have no relevant financial issues to discuss. Although we'll focus on the evidence best for best practice, I'd like to begin the talk with a discussion of both the incidence and the prevalence of bronchopulmonary dysplasia, a little bit on the associations and various risk factors or protective factors associated with BPD. The definitions that we've used over time for bronchopulmonary dysplasia, and then get to the heart of things and talk about how we can prevent or treat bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Let's start with the fact that BPD came from what was probably the most important intervention in the field of neonatology in the 20th century. In the 1970s, mechanical ventilation was introduced in the care of critically ill newborns and absolutely altered the ability for us to support these infants. 
looking here at what at the time was perhaps the most serious population we cared for, babies 1,000 to 1,499 grams. And we can see that with the introduction of mechanical ventilation, survival changed from a little less than 30% to over 80%, a most remarkable decade in our field. But for every move we make forward, there are consequences. And in this effort to have more babies survive and use mechanical ventilation, we literally created a new disease described by Northway as bronchopulmonary dysplasia. The factors involved in BPD are thought to be related to a variety of issues. First and foremost, the susceptible host, the preterm infant, and even amongst those preterm infants, infants with a genetic predisposition towards BPD or with fetal asphyxia or infection. Add to that susceptible host acute lung injury caused by, caused by bronchotrauma and possible infection. And then the secondary injury of oxygen that leads to abnormal healing and scarring and the disease we now think of as BPD. The original definition of BPD was basically the need for oxygen at 28 to 30 days. Infants had to have been on assisted ventilation for at least the first three days of life and had radiographic features consistent with BPD. That definition did not really stand the test of time. This is work that we're all familiar with from Andrew Shannon. And it points out here, when we look at the initial gestation, plotted against corrected age, as smaller and smaller babies survived, babies down to 25 and 26 weeks gestation, we can see that being in oxygen here in the green stars did little to predict whether or not infants in fact had poor pulmonary outcomes. Sometime between 34 and 36 weeks adjusted age, we see that over half of the infants will have poor pulmonary follow-up. And therefore, we start to think that perhaps using a corrected age was a much more important landmark to determine whether or not an infant had BPD. BPD has changed very little in the past 20 years. At the beginning of the 21st century, we saw rates around 29%. And now, in recent years, we don't see huge differences. We see rates around 27%. So BPD is still with us and still of great concern. Given the little change we saw, people have begun to think, well, maybe we don't have the right definition for BPD. Maybe our definition is not specific enough are granular enough for us to really understand who is at risk and who is not at risk. But this feels like the proverbial moving of the goalposts. And I'll share with you some of my thoughts about the newer definitions. First of all, BPD itself has several different clinical phenotypes, which are very different in how they affect the baby and how we might consider treating the baby. There are infants that we describe as having BPD who have pulmonary vascular disease. There are infants with airway disease, and there are infants with parenchymal lung disease or various combinations of these phenotypes. The causal factors as well as the treatments for each of these phenotypes will be different and will need to be thought through carefully as we design both our care for these infants and our future research. There have been some more granular definitions of BPD that have been used, and some might be very straightforward, easy to apply, and useful. This is work from Aaron Prance and colleagues, taking a look at categorizing BPD as mild, moderate, or severe. And you can see, for example, for infants with severe BPD, these are infants in an FiO2 of greater than or equal to 30%, and on some form of positive pressure, or continuous positive airway pressure. There have been further modifications of this definition. Here, the modification from the workshop 
held in 2018, that begins to introduce some of the more recent ways that we support infants, such as high-flow nasal cannula or nasal intermittent positive pressure ventilation. Work by Jensen and colleagues shows us that, in fact, the more severe BPD that you have, defined based on Aaron Krantz's definitions, clearly adds to your risk of having death or respiratory morbidity or death or developmental impairment. Here in the severe BPD groups, we see 77% of the infants either dying or having respiratory morbidity and 79% dying or having developmental impairment. With all this talk about changing definitions of BPD, I think it's important to remind ourselves that our current definitions are still quite useful. Here is some work from the Canadian Neonatal Follow-Up Network Investigators looking at various definitions of BPD and their impact on adverse outcomes at 18 to 21 months. The first thing that you notice is that the classic definition from Northway and Collins of oxygen to 28 days is not useful in predicting adverse outcome at 18 to 21 months. Although the point estimate suggested that there is a, some small predictive value, we see the confidence interval is associated with no increase in risk. But when we look at the very simple definition of oxygen at 36 weeks postmenstrual age, we see in fact that it predicts a 2.6 fold increase and the odds of having adverse outcome. And the confidence interval tells us that, in fact, it is always predictive of poor outcome and clearly still a useful definition. So why do I care about BPD? Well, it has tremendous impact on infants well after hospital discharge. If we look at the first two years of life, we see that infants who have been discharged with the diagnosis of BPD have an increased risk of rehospitalization for other respiratory illnesses. When we follow them into school age at four to five years of age, we see an increased risk of asthma and other chronic respiratory symptoms. And even patients who were followed into adolescence, including patients from Northway's original cohort, show demonstrably abnormal pulmonary function when tested in their early adult years. This is work from Barb Schmidt and colleagues taking a look at infants who had been enrolled in a trial of indomethacin to prevent intraventricular hemorrhage. And it demonstrates that although problems such as brain injury or severe ROP may be more highly associated with death or severe developmental delay, BPD alone carries with it a 2.4 fold increase in the risk of death or severe developmental delay. BPD is also a huge burden on families and resources. Looking here at length of stay of infants with and without BPD, we can see that for very low birth weight infants who do not have chronic lung disease or BPD, there's an approximately 60 day stay in neonatal intensive care. Now, that is almost two months and that's plenty long enough. But infants who do have the diagnosis of BPD stay over 100 days. We're talking well over three months and we're talking about almost 40 days difference in hospitalization, a huge burden to families and society. So what can we do to prevent or treat BPD? Well, there are many candidates, many interventions that we consider when we think about how we will treat or prevent BPD. And let's examine the evidence behind them in the next few minutes. The first question is, can we prevent BPD with some of the newer techniques of respiratory support, including newer forms of mechanical ventilation, high frequency oscillation, or with less invasive forms of respiratory support like nasal CPAP. Here's a very simple intervention that we probably all use in our care, synchronized mechanical ventilation for respiratory support. 
There are seven trials involving over 1,800 infants. The results are surprising. Few trials actually report on BPD, and little effect is seen. Here we see there are four trials reported using the older definition of oxygen at 28 days, and in fact there is no significant improvement in BPD defined at 28 days. And although only two trials reported 36 weeks, again there is no strong suggestion that there is a big impact of using synchronized mechanical ventilation when it comes to the issue of improving BPD outcomes. And then there's high frequency oscillatory ventilation. I think that we all believed that this would represent a huge step forward in the prevention and treatment of BPD. We thought this based on the fact that we were not beaten giving conventional tidal volumes to infants, that the animal studies seemed very promising when it came to reducing lung injury. And so I think most of us thought that the trials would clearly show an advantage in decreasing lung injury in these infants. This is a highly studied issue. Cools and colleagues studied elective high-frequency oscillatory ventilation compared to conventional ventilation for acute pulmonary dysfunction in preterm infants. It's an evidence-rich area. 19 trials involving over 4,000 infants have been published. What's surprising is the very precise but very uninspiring results that we have seen from these trials. First, surprisingly, when we group these trials together, we in fact see that in the 13 trials that reported on pulmonary air leak, there is an increased risk of pulmonary air leak from these studies. We see that there is a slight concerning trend towards increased IVH, particularly concerning when it comes to severe intraventricular hemorrhage. And we see small benefits in chronic lung disease, but no benefit in death. Despite these results, what we've seen is that many children at some point in time in their neonatal intensive care get treated with high frequency ventilation. In terms of our current practice, approximately one out of every five very low birth rate infant is on high frequency ventilation at some point in time in their NICU stay despite the minimal ev evidence that supports that this is a superior way to ventilate infants. There are some changes in how we've approached conventional ventilation that may bear some fruit. When we look at the trials of volume targeted versus pressure limited ventilation, we see that there are 20 trials that address this issue. But we can also see that there are relatively small trials and that only a little over 1,000 infants have been enrolled in these studies. When we look at these studies, either those that used a variety of ventilation modes or strictly used volume targeted modes, we see a small but significant decrease in the risk of BPD or death. The point estimate being a decrease of 27%, consistent with a decrease of as much as 41% or as little as 11%. Many units, my own included, have adopted this approach towards ventilation although we must admit that there are fewer studies to support this than we might hope. Of course, there's a great deal of excitement around our use of less invasive support, such as CPAP. We're all familiar with this original study from Avery and colleagues that looked at seven score centers, centers that were involved in a grant on lung development, and evaluated their rates of BPD for this study defined in the old way at 28 days. And the one remarkable thing that Dr. Avery reported was one center, Columbia, New York, had a noticeably decreased risk of BPD compared to the other score centers. Columbia was well known for having a very different approach to respiratory support, stabilizing infants on nasal CPAP. When we look at other data, we see that in fact the Columbia experience can be replicated. Here, in a study by Linda Van Martyr, she compared the centers that she worked out in Boston compared to the results at the center 
at, in New York at Columbia. What she noted was the following. In Boston, they used much more IMV, they used much more surfactant, and they used very little CPAP compared to Columbia in blue. But what they found is that they had an almost fourfold increase in their rates of chronic lung disease compared to Columbia using its much less invasive approach regarding CPAP. Some of the original trials of aggressive use of prophylactic surfactant administration suggested that that might be a superior approach. But once we started looking at the trials that compared aggressive surfactant and mechanical ventilation to stabilization on CPAP with selective surfactant treatment only for the infants who failed, we see that in fact there is advantages to the more patient selective approach. Here, looking at the NICHD support study and Mike, Mike Dunn's study done at Vaughan, we see that in these two studies, they in fact suggest that the more patient selective approach is superior and when looked at together, show a significant improvement in death or BPD at 36 weeks postmenstrual age. What we see in Vermont Oxford Network is a steady increase over the past two decades in the use of continuous positive airway pressure. In the early 1990s, only one out of three babies was treated at some point in their course with CPAP. And today we see that virtually eight out of 10 babies gets treated with CPAP. So what about pharmacologic interventions? Can we prevent or treat BPD with specific pharmacologic interventions? Well, let's start with the example of vitamin A supplementation to prevent mortality and morbidity in very low birth weight infants. Darlo and colleagues identified 10 trials involving 1,460 infants. In these trials, there is one very large trial, the Tyson trial from 1999, done by the NICHD neonatal network. There is a positive effect in that single large trial, and when merged with all the studies, this effect remains, suggesting that there is a decrease in the risk of chronic lung disease at 36 weeks postmenstrual age of approximately 15%. The risk difference, the absolute difference in the risk, suggests that it may be as much as a 9% or even a 16% decrease. But there is concern that this estimate is not very precise and that it is consistent with only a 1% decrease, leading to, in fact, what would require a 100 infants studied in order to see one less infant with chronic lung disease. And this brings out the point that every statistically significant result that we see in our trials may not get translated into our practice. Here we have in this figure the results of a trial that we would probably all agree is almost certainly beneficial. Even the lowest confidence interval is in the area that we would consider quite significant for infants. But the problem is that the vitamin A trials inhabit this territory where they just sneak over the line of identity and may in fact represent only a very trivial improvement in care. Depending on availability of care, the costs of care, the discomforts of care, people might well look at a treatment that only shows this benefit and say that it's not worth incorporating in practice. One of the great surprises in the story of BPD recently has been the studies and the increasing use of caffeine therapy. Barb Schmidt and colleagues did a trial of caffeine therapy looking at the developmental outcomes of these infants. The reports were quite heartening, but quite surprising. In the initial report, reporting in, hos out, in hospital and discharge outcomes, they noted a very significant decrease in BPD from 46.9% in the control infants to 36.3% in the caffeine treated infants. A decrease in the odds of BPD of 
At two years, they also noted a decrease in the risk of cerebral palsy, falling from 7.3% to 4.4%. Now, those developmental changes did not really hold up as well when these children were looked at later at five years. But the fact of the matter is that caffeine has shown great promise in improving BPD and the suggestion that it may also improve developmental outcome. So then the question comes, who should I treat? Well, Dr. Schmidt's study was very pragmatic, was very practical, and allowed infants to be enrolled if they needed treatment for their apnea, or if the investigators felt that they were immature enough that they were at high risk of apnea and therefore could prophylax them, or in intubated infants wanted to start caffeine in and around extubation. You can see here in all three of these subgroups, the point estimate suggests some benefit. But the subgroup that involves prophylactic care does not show a traditionally statistical effect. Some have interpreted this as we should restrict our treatment to infants who show signs of apnea. I would argue that this is an artifact of sample size and that, in fact, the point estimates are consistent, the confidence intervals are consistent, and it's simply a matter that we lack precision because only two-thirds as many babies were treated prophylactically. From a system's point of view, I would consider strongly the use of prophylaxis in high-risk infants such that no one sort of fell through the cracks and did not receive appropriate treatment. Now, there are many trials of surfactant therapy done by Drs. Ozak, Sager, and myself. These historical trials have demonstrated a tremendous difference in the initial need for oxygen, for the need for ventilator support, strong decreases in pneumothorax, and even improvements in survival. So you would have thought that this potent therapy that improves our lung function of our preterm babies would translate into a decrease in BPD, but in fact, it doesn't. Most of the trials did not show an effect on BPD alone. And why is that? I would argue that in fact, we do see an effect of surfactant on bronchopulmonary dysplasia. And this is just an example from Lecti's work. And again, looking at the older definition of BPD in 28 days, but it serves the point. Infants who previously died of their complications of prematurity and respiratory distress now lived. But those infants that lived did have some lung damage. On the other end here, Infants who had BPD now survive without BPD. And so it is a frame shift that ultimately leads to more survivors without BPD, which is our goal and demonstrates a real impact of surfactant therapy on BPD. When we look at BPD or death combined, we see that that is in fact the case. And we see that there is any place from a 4% decrease to as much as a 14% decrease in the absolute rate of BPD or death in infants from the trials. Now there is some newer therapy that is gaining traction that is well worth thinking about, and that is minimally invasive surfactant administration. This review from Abdul Latif and colleagues is just coming out in Cochrane Neonatal now and suggests that there may be great benefit from these less invasive approaches. There's a fair amount of literature that is being generated. 16 trials were identified involving over 2,000 infants. And there are two approaches that the trials used. There's one approach, which we affectionately think of as head-to-head, -head, which is a direct comparison. In this case, comparing thin catheter administration to inshore. In this direct comparison, you have to imagine that the infants have just reached the threshold where you would agree they require surfactant therapy, and you give infants either surfactant via thin catheter or surfactant via inshore, intubation, surfactant, followed by rapid extubation. 
The other approach that trials have used is more strategic and, to my mind, more interesting. If I had a thin catheter that I could use to treat spontaneously breathing babies, would I want to sneak surfactant in at an earlier point in time than a time when they have clearly failed my therapy and require intubation and surfactant and selective administration? And so this strategic approach does not treat infants at the same point in time, but compares two different treatment approaches. Here in Abdul Latif's meta-analysis, we see that they have separated the trials that use thin catheter versus insure compared to thin catheter versus a more selective approach. Many fewer studies have used the selective approach, but in the many studies that have compared thin catheter administration to insure, we in fact see a tremendous decrease in the need for intubation within the first 72 hours of life, with a point estimate for the relative risk of 0 0.61 and a typical risk difference of minus 12%. For the selective approach, we also see a very positive outcome in preventing intubation within 72 hours. And overall, we see an approximately 30% decrease in the risk of the need for intubation. That translates into some very important clinical findings. Here, looking at death or BPD. In the infants who had the direct head-to-head -head comparison, thin catheter versus insure, we see a 48% decrease in the risk of dying or having BPD, with a risk difference of minus 11%. That point estimate suggests that if we treat nine infants with thin catheter administration versus insure, we have one fewer infant with death or BPD. That's a very potent effect. We see many fewer studies, just one study that looked at death or BPD with a more strategic approach, which also suggests, but does not show a statistically significant benefit. Other trials are coming out on this issue of minimally invasive surfactant therapy particularly the Optimist trial out of Australasia. And with those results, I think that we will probably get, derive a much clearer picture about whether or not this approach is worthy of considering. Of course, we're all familiar with the results from the postnatal steroid studies. There have been studies that looked at early postnatal steroid treatment and studies that have looked at late postnatal treatment. In the early studies, Infants were treated before seven days of age, and there are 30 studies involving 3,750 infants. Fewer studies looked at late surfactant treatment, but there's still plenty, 21 studies involving 1,424 infants. And most of you are familiar with the results of this rich environment. What we see is that early postnatal steroid therapy led to a very significant decrease in chronic lung disease at 36 weeks gestation. We see the same decrease in chronic lung disease with the infants who are treated with late postnatal steroid therapy. And in fact, because these infants are sicker, there is a much larger absolute difference, a 15% decrease in chronic lung disease. Unfortunately, what we've also seen is an increase in the risk of cerebral palsy. In the 13 studies of early therapy, we see a 2% increase in the risk of cerebral palsy. We are similarly concerned about a risk of cerebral palsy in the late studies, but the result is not statistically significant. This has led to some very serious warnings regarding concerns about the use of postnatal steroids. Here, showing an example from the Committee of Fetus and Newborn, stating that given the limited short-term benefits and the absence of long-term benefit, as well as the serious short-term and long-term complications, that routine use of systemic de dexamethasone is not recommended. That led to a tremendous decrease in our use of postnatal steroids, going from 29% in the late 1990s down to a range of 7 to 9% in the 21st century. That is laudable, but the question remains, are we treating the right number of infants? Should we be treating 
any of these infants? Should we be treating more of these infants? What's the right patient to treat with postnatal corticosteroids? Lex Doyle does not answer this question for us, but he shows us why this is a difficult question to tackle. Here we see a meta-regression looking at the effects of, on death or CP, as well as the chronic lung disease and control groups. And what we see is that someplace around 40 or 50 percent, if the control group has that greater risk of chronic lung disease, then in fact that's associated with a high risk of CP. And this population probably der derives more benefit than risk in treatment. But in this other relatively healthier population, where the risk of chronic lung disease is less than 40%, you're probably doing more harm than good. And so we've introduced a variety of risk calculators to think about who, as they evolve their course in the neonatal intensive care unit, deserves the treatment with steroids. I'll briefly touch on the issue of inhaled nitric oxide for respiratory failure and note that there is little benefit that has been shown from the meta-analyses of trials. There are 17 trials involving 4,065 infants. These trials looked at infants who were sick in the first three days of life. They looked at infants later after one week of life who had evolving risks of BPD. And some just looked at very high risk preterm infants who we all know carry a risk of BPD. And what they showed was little or no effect on chronic lung disease or death at 36 weeks postmenstrual age, no matter which of these approaches was used. That has led to some statements that have cautioned us about the use of INO in preterm populations. Here, looking at the clinical report from the uh, fetus and newborn committee, we see they state that the results of randomized trials show no improvement in survival, and they, they do not recommend the use of INO in preventing or ameliorating BPD. But interestingly, that hasn't stopped us. Infants 23 to 29 weeks gestation have an ever-increasing exposure to INO in the past 10 years. One area where real benefits can be gained is in quality improvement. This is work that we have done in Vermont Oxford Network, and here's some of the original work that was done in the 1990s, where we asked NICUs to form multidisciplinary teams that would work together with a trained facilitator. They received instruction in quality improvement, reviewed performance data, identified common improvement goals, and implemented potentially better practices some of these better practices when it came to chronic lung disease, we might not agree with today, but in the 1990s, we thought that increased use of antenatal steroids, policies for better surfactant use, less invasive respiratory support, appropriate use of postnatal steroids, improved nutrition, and vitamin A might all improve chronic lung disease. And we did what all quality improvement projects do. We planned, we did, we studied, we acted, and we wound up with a significant decrease in chronic lung disease in the groups that had attempted these quality improvement activities compared to the rest of the network, which was not engaged in such activities. So where does this leave us? Well, this is, a, I think, a very important and interesting example regarding the types of improvements we have seen over the past two decades. Perhaps the poster child for quality improvement and improvement in our care is late infection, is nosocomial infection. And this is an interesting graph that shows us where we were at the beginning in 2005 and where centers stand at the end of a 10-year period. Clearly, if we're plotting the best decile and the best quartile, when we begin the process, the best decile is at 10% and the best quartiles at 25%. When it comes to infection, you can see that the number of centers that were meeting the best quartile over 10 years rose 
such that 98% of centers were performing as well as the best quartile, the 25% in those 10 years. And similarly, centers that were at the best 10th percentile, 90% of centers by 2014 were achieving those remarkable results. Sort of a testimony to what was achievable and doable. But we have not seen those changes when it comes to chronic lung disease. We see here that, in fact, only a fraction of the babies have improved the best decile or the best quartile. And so our challenge remains to reduce, if not eliminate, major morbidities as best we can and think about how we can, if possible, make the types of impacts we made in nosocomial infection on chronic lung disease. So I'll stop there and look forward to your questions. Thank you. Well, that was an excellent talk, uh, Professor Sol. Now, main request, uh, 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 let me welcome the moderator for today, Dr. Giridhar. Uh, uh, and uh, th thank you, Professor Sol. Uh, uh, thank you for being here with us live also. And then we are taken care of the technical aspect also by uh, just in case uh, factor. So uh, le let's straight away, straight away go on to the question answer session. Over to Giridhar. Uh, thank you, sir, uh, for the invitation. Uh, it was wonderful listening to Professor uh, Dr. Sol. I think uh, he had very uh, clearly uh, described a very complex uh, uh, inter I mean, topic in neonatology. He has brought out the various aspects of the epidemiology of BPD and also the outcomes of BPD. And not only that, the interventions related to uh, I mean, BPD. Uh, so uh, we saw, uh, I mean, uh, what are the evidence-based interventions that are there now and which could have a bearing on the outcomes is related to BPD. So we can take up some questions now which are there in the box. Uh, um, the first question is by Dr. Neha. If the baby has already been categorized as having BPD, uh, is there any role in continuing caffeine if the baby is not apneic but still requires minimal oxygen support beyond 34 weeks? Well, thank you, and I'm happy to join you live now. I hope that this is transmitting well. Um, I live in a very rural situation. Yes, you're, you're good, sir. Your voice is good, sir. Very good. Thank you. Uh, so in reference to the question, caffeine obviously has multiple effects on the preterm infant. The effect on BPD, in fact, is somewhat surprising and interesting to postulate about why it might affect BPD. I would argue that the reason that it affects BPD is that it keeps us from unnecessary ventilation support, that we don't wind up intubating infants because of their apneic episodes, or in fact, offering them more oxygen on that basis. I don't know if there's another role for caffeine related to BPD after 34 weeks. Certainly some people have postulated that the bronchodilator effects of a methyl xanthine like caffeine might be of some benefit. And others have also argued that there are many episodes, even if we don't see frank apnea, of um, poor saturation and dips in saturation. And so there is an active group experimenting and looking at continuing caffeine in that window that you ask about. But specifically, I can't say that it will help BPD or not, but I do think it's a very interesting research question. I'm busy sitting here saying, I think you should start it on everyone, but I don't think I know exactly when to stop it on everyone. I hope the um, answer given by Professor has been helpful. Uh, so we can, I have one more question. Uh, can you please uh, tell the evidence-based interventions for treating established BPD, uh, visible steroids, ventilation, and uh, caffeine? I think uh, you had already brought out these aspects in your uh, lecture, sir. Uh, just you can just uh, uh, tell, summarize the uh, I mean evidence for steroids, ventilation, and caffeine, sir. 
So in, in summary, the most potent therapy for evolving bronchopulmonary dysplasia is undoubtedly corticosteroids. Um, steroids will have huge impact on your rates of BPD. You saw in the talk that the majority of our studies were done with a very aggressive approach of early steroids in at-risk infants. And clearly in that group, reason, real harms were described. So you have a group of infants who, although they have high risk, also have proven harms. That's a bad situation to think about an aggressive or prophylactic approach. What we do see is in fact, similarly excellent results if we wait and try to select infants sometime after seven or 10 days of age. There are various calculators that can be used, but frankly, infants who are still in oxygen or on positive pressure at day 14 to 21 require your consideration for postnatal steroids. Why would you take the risk is the question, and that really goes back to Lex Doyle's meta-regression which says that chronic lung disease in and of itself has a significant risk of developmental problems. And when that risk in your population tips to over 50 or 60%, then it is probably beneficial to treat with steroids. And that may well explain why for most of us, we still treat around seven or 8% of very low birth weight infants with postnatal steroids. I did not get into the debate about hydrocortisone versus dexamethasone, and I don't think that's fully clear. Uh, hydrocortisone seems to be a safer alternative, but it may be a less effective alternative. In recent network meta-analyses, where they look at trials and they uh, do indirect comparisons, the late use of dexamethasone seems to win in terms of both effect and side effects, uh, but I don't think it's completely clear and practice will vary. Uh, you also asked about, asked about ventilation. The issue of preventing BPD, I think, comes to a idea of don't <laughs> ventilate the infant if you can. Use less invasive support. If you're using more invasive support early on, um, I think that we need to be considering volume-targeted ventilation. I think there's some excellent work that I would refer you to from Steve Abman and colleagues um, where they talk about the late management of the ventilation of these infants and the problem build, pro problems of VQ mismatch. And I would refer you to his writings on that subject. I would summarize it just briefly to say that the way we ventilate the sick preterm infant early on with a non-compliant lung is a very poor approach to the infant who has evolving BPD and various issues uh, of underlying lung injury that are not related to surfactant deficiency. Uh, and so styles of ventilation in the infant with established BPD should be quite different. I'm not sure if that summarizes things well enough. Are there any other questions that you think would be worth exploring? Yes, sir. Yeah, I think, uh, but uh, the uh, delegate that uh, question regarding in, uh, these interventions in established BP research, is there any uh, uh, role of steroids, ventilation, and caffeine in uh, babies who establish BPD? So there clearly is a role for steroids in evolving BPD. So that's in that spectrum of establishment. And there's no doubt that people have been using steroids, chronic steroids, or even inhaled steroids in those patients. Infants truly with yeah. long-term chronic BPD are poorly studied. Um, there is some work with nitric oxide in that group, which I am unimpressed with and think it is not an appropriate uh, level of care. Uh, most of us, when we think of the infant who has established BPD, go into a mode of chronic care, of improved nutrition. There is a great deal of thought nowadays, mostly at the children's hospitals, certainly here in the States, about whether or not tracheotomy is an important uh, contributor to the care of the infant with extremely bad established BPD. Uh, but there's much less research there to really try to advise you on. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I think uh, there are a few set of questions which have asked about the role of fluid restriction in uh, BPD and also the role of diuretics in BPD. Sir. Uh, 
So we all do fluid restriction. And there is, when we look at various databases like Mednax's database about use of drugs, we know that diuretics are very, very commonly used. The sole literature involves very short-term outcomes, looking at issues like pulmonary function. And although there are changes that can be demonstrated with diuretics, there is very little evidence of long-term benefit. So it is clearly one of those drugs that we use a great deal with very little proven benefit of effect. Yeah, so I think there has been one more question on the role of nutritional interventions. I think you brought out the importance of vitamin A, uh, nutritional interventions. So, I mean, uh, any other nutritional interventions have been tried and uh, just a question from my side. Uh, why do you think that the uh, a DHA supplementation in preterm infants did not work? Why it actually increased the I mean, incidence of uh, death in the, I mean, BPD, that group? Uh, I'm not, because uh, there is a biological plausibility to that. I mean, uh, DHA is an anti-inflammatory. It's supposed to bring down inflammation, but it increased. Why didn't it work in that particular trial? So? You know, there is a list of anti-inflammatory agents that disappointed, right? It's a fairly long list, actually. There's vitamin, you could put vitamin E on your list. You could put superoxide dismutase on your list. Um, some of them um, perhaps are still candidates for treatment uh, or for use in treatment, um, but it's very hard to know. Uh, I see here in, in the talk here that human milk is lung protective. Um, I, I, I don't want to be too skeptical. Those, those, quote, those studies tend to come from epidemiologic review, uh, and observational reviews. Um, I'm certainly a big proponent of human milk, particularly from a point of view of nutrition and neurodevelopment. Um, I'm not so convinced uh, on the data that it, it is in and of itself lung protective. Um, in answer to your question though, there are many times we think we understand the causal pathway and think we have interventions that will help that don't prove to help. That may be for lack of understanding of the causal pathway, or it may in fact be that uh, these interventions we're not giving them in the right way, the right dose, the right timing, et cetera. Um, but, so many therapies that have been tested that seem to have biological plausibility that didn't pan out. I see a few questions here about um, thin catheter administration. Um, I know that there's, that there's going to be some great interest as larger trials come out. Um, people speak of it as less invasive surfactant administration. It is not. You still use a laryngoscope. <laughs> you still have to feed a catheter through, there is a skill set that needs to be learned. I think the big issue there is that the baby is spontaneously breathing and we don't add a lot of positive pressure ventilation in distributing the surfactant. And so we avoid barotrauma. I think any number of approaches will probably be useful, feeding tubes, catheters, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I do think that once we see the results from the larger trials, this may well be something we really want to consider in our practices. There's a question on uh, the um, role of uh, macrolides uh, in uh, BPD, both in the antenatal and in the postnatal periods. Right. So I didn't really touch on the question. I just very briefly alluded to infection as being part of the causal pathway for BPD. And certainly urea plasma has been implicated, um, a microorganism that we have difficulty um, identifying and culturing and may be much more prevalent and concerning than we think. There have been studies in treating mothers antenatally and the babies postnatally um, with um, various macrolide treatments, et cetera, erythromycin and such with unfortunately limited results. So although I have concern about the role of uh, infection in being a, uh, one of the causal factors, we don't see much from the results. And I don't think there's necessarily a role for treatment uh, as part of our routine. Uh, uh, Professor, as you're aware that uh, India is a country where uh, there's a huge burden of pre-term pre births. 
and uh, i think uh, now more and more babies which are uh, quite small uh, born in the limits of viability like 24 weeks 25 weeks are surviving so bpd is one thing that is uh, come to i mean i mean it's going to affect us in the days to come so i mean uh, if you are uh, i mean uh, if you could give us some guide i mean uh, what is your take on any quality improvement measures uh, in the indian setting or resource limited settings which we need to do to bring down the incidence of bpd That's a wonderful question. I think one of the things we are told was the prevention of infection and how it uh, uh, helped over a period of time. I mean, uh, I mean, any uh, uh, QI measures in uh, resource limited settings which could actually bring down the BPD or similar outcomes. Hmm. It's a great question, and I'll, I'll take it at to its most basic point. Um, many of the interventions that we had the opportunity to discuss this evening. uh have small limited benefits quality improvement seeks to amplify those small minimal benefits on top of each other to create a more measurable benefit so what then is quality improvement to india the important issue is the process itself Okay you are absolutely correct to say well what about our resources what do what is our problem do we have more infection what resources are available to us it's all about your team and about your process and so i really commend the the thought behind this question um you need to take a look at these interventions and say what makes sense in our context and that goes right from antenatal care and antenatal steroids to your delivery room practices to how you support the babies from a respiratory point of view it goes to whether or not you believe your population has a bigger concern about infection and how you're going to approach those aspects of it but more than anything it goes to thinking through this this list of potentially better practices and deciding within your teams what you're going to do and standardizing that it should not be just because you are on service that we do one thing and then i show up and everyone says oh roger likes to do it this way okay it should be an agreed upon standard of the best practices sometimes you can't agree and you have to admit to that up front and explain that to your staff and to the parents but more often than not you can come up with what you think from this discussion makes sense in your context but do create those teams to do that type of work i i really commend that question um so there were lots of questions on uh, the choice of steroids the candidates uh, who are eligible for the steroids and uh, the, i mean uh, uh, when do we start them and uh, what dosage and uh, how, how long they have to give uh, any clarity on these sir it's always hard just to pick something out of the air there as, as one what do not use them prophylactically except if you're considering blood pressure support as your mode you do not use them in the first week of life unless it's an issue of a persistent uh and resistant hypotension so i don't think there's a role for steroids in bpd in that early window i would as a staff begin considering it uh sometime after 10 days of life um but i really try to resist until days 14 to 21 or around then although you can use calculators that are available on the web that were based on data collected from the NICHD neonatal network i don't think that they really change your decision infants at 14 to at 2 or 3 weeks of life who are still either on positive pressure or on oxygen are probably candidates i note here in some of the chat yes you have to rule out issues like patent ductus arteriosus and infection before you go and start your steroid therapy so you need to be confident that you're dealing with evolving chronic lung disease it's very tempting to think that hydrocortisone might be the right answer and i think in europe many people are choosing hydrocortisone based on their studies but from my understanding it's a less potent drug and i would rather select more carefully who needs treatment so minimize the number of infants i treat but we still treat with dexamethasone here we try to start at lower doses and we have opted to use the doses that were in Lex Doyle's dart trial although that trial was small and stopped early 
It had a, um, an excellent and very usable dosing regimen. Um, I don't think that just three day courses, you wind up starting and stopping and starting and stopping. In the DART protocol, there's enough period of time to see and chart your benefit. I would use that time wisely in terms of if I'm going to start steroids, I want to have a plan towards extubation uh, and, and improved care. I want to get to a new place in the child's care if we're going to pay the price of using the steroids. I don't know if that answers some, if not most, of the questions on steroid use. Yes, sir. I think it covers most of the things on uh, steroid use. Okay, I, uh, good. Uh, so, uh, so what do you think are the, uh, I mean, uh, the, uh, the interventions in the annual, what is in the horizon when it comes to I mean, prevention or treatment of BPD, sir? Uh, is uh, stem cells going to be the answer? <laughs> I, I love to joke. I am so enamored with the work being done with stem cells uh, from a variety of the people who I consider to be the cutting edge researchers, uh, Bernard Thibault, Stella Korenbachis at, at Harvard. Uh, the work uh, with the cells themselves, the supernatants from the cells is so exciting. I joke that perhaps if I ever have great grandchildren and they hear about our work on surfactant, they'll ask me, you know, grandpa, is it true you gave cow spit to babies? Didn't you know about stem cells? Uh, I think that that will clearly be the most promising therapy that we test in the 21st century, but it has a long way to go, but very exciting therapy. So I think it covers most of the question. Uh, there is one, just one last question uh, by uh, Dr. Mubashir Hassan Shah. is asked about uh, an appropriate research question or a promising intervention that can be studied in RCT about uh, BPD. The needs for the so exploration. That depends, on, that depends on how um, pragmatic you want to be. Obviously, we just talked about stem cells. I think that that world of 21st century research is the single most exciting thing to contemplate. But I think the question is more about the pragmatic issue. Okay, we just said we don't know about all these things that we're currently using. I think that the appropriate trial of diuretics would be brilliant, okay? It's so often used, it has so many complications, and yet we don't really know the impact of diuretics. I think further trials on some of the um, anti- microbial agents uh, would also be warranted in terms of getting enough patients uh, to have a more precise estimates of effect. So I think that there, are, there is some room for pragmatic trials. The difficulty of writing a trial for something like diuretics is fitting it in with standard practice where people have equipoise to test it. So even though I can say in the lecture, oh, there's no good evidence, the reality is that we all are using it way too much and it will be very difficult to, to tell our staffs to use it in a more controlled way. Uh, but I think from a pragmatic point of view, that would be very exciting and useful research. Uh, sorry, I just missed one more question. Um, uh, there's a question on the prevalence of uh, BPD over the years. Do you feel it has remained stagnant or it's slightly increased because of the increased survival of preterm infants uh, who are more prone for BPD? I think you brought out some aspects in that in your talk, sir. So can you please clarify here? So it's a great question. Um, and all I can say is that we're still, we're not seeing the differences even in the 26 to 28 weaker as much as we would. This disease is with us, yes, we see more as more small infants survive. There's no question about that. But I also don't think we've made the progress in the patients we've been routinely treating. And I think we need to give greater thought to how we will um, approach the, the problem. So uh, that's, I mean, another, I think two more questions which have gone to the chat box. Uh, the question on, uh, I mean, when do you consider tracheostomy in babies with severe BPD and what particular gestational age? More so let me, start, let me start saying I don't. I, I avoid tracheostomy at all costs and I may not be right on this issue. Um, there is more and more literature coming from the hospitals that I would term quaternary hospitals in terms of their care. Um, hospitals that see a lot more of these sick kids or get the referrals from hospitals with infants who are three or four months that old with BPD that are thinking about tracheostomy um, for the obvious 
issues of shortening the dead space and being able to give CPAP and the developmental issues for babies of suddenly not having something stuck in their mouth for being able to position them and, and improve their developmental care. I consider it very invasive and I'm very concerned about it. And I don't want it to be a short-term answer to get infants out of the hospital, but I absolutely understand and respect the thinking from my colleagues who are pro-tracheostomy that, okay, we have this underlying condition. How can we normalize this child's uh, care such that we can care for the child in different settings, uh, imp improve the care um, and improve the child's development. So I, I fight tracheostomy uh, I have rarely, if ever, done it in a BPD case, but I recognize the argument for it and recognize it's an emerging uh, line of thought regarding care. Thank you, sir. Uh, so uh, the last question is going to be about the role of the uh, uh, fetal inflammatory response. The maternal uh, intramniotic infection is a cause for BPD. So is identifying and treating uh, this actually helpful in prevention of BPD, sir? Yeah, that's a great question. We know the epidemiology. We know the cause, some of the issues around the causal pathway. Maternal chorioamnionitis is highly associated with chronic lung disease. And interestingly, we see less um, RDS in those babies, but more chronic lung disease, suggesting that it's the inflammatory response. Um, but it has been very disappointing in terms of trying to treat these underlying conditions and see an impact on BPD. But I do think it's a, an area, important area for ongoing research. So any a role for biomarkers in the future of BPD management, sir? Uh, biomarkers is such a general term. Um, I'm not sure what we're referring to, but I'm assuming some of the inflammatory markers um, uh, that we see uh, if we did tracheal suctioning, et cetera, et cetera, might be useful in, in understanding how we can modulate the inflammatory response. And so there may be some small role there in research and certainly in developing our research directions. Um, I, I did address the core definition of, of the core issue of definition, and that's a very hot topic right now. Uh, although I have participated in some of that work, I am concerned that we need simple definitions that we can apply in large populations to, under, to understand how we can improve quality. And that if we overly complexify the definitions or the number of biomarkers that, that are necessary to make the diagnosis, that we will actually defeat our, our main purpose in terms of identifying and treating the disease. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think uh, we have uh, taken up most of the questions. So I think uh, uh, most are related questions. So you had answered them in the during your talk and also during the earlier discussions. Uh, I think there are no more questions, sir. So thank you, sir, for the wonderful lecture and also clarifying the various questions that have come in the ring. I think uh, your answers have been very useful. Uh, so over to uh, Dr. Manoj, sir. Mute. <laughs> Sorry. Professor Saul, as usual, uh, your talk was a, a true academic feast. Every time we listen to you, we want to hear more and more. And uh, as we always need, uh, have to uh, say at the end, sweet th all sweet things need to come to an end. So we need to wind up. Uh, you have, we have taken more time of uh, yours than we had asked for. And it is so nice of you to spend the time. Uh, it's such a wonderful talk. Oh, I joined the chorus in lot many responses. I am already getting congratulating uh, for organizing this talk and then co complimenting the talk. So thank you so much. Uh, we hope to hear more from you in the near future also, Professor Sol. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. It's a great pleasure. Thank you, sir. May also thank, thank you, thank you, sir. May also thank the moderator for today, Dr. Giridhar and uh, uh, Dr. Sushma uh, uh, Nangia, who was supposed to join us. Uh, she could not because of some reasons. So let me thank uh, both of you. And at the end, let me thank each and every one of you, respected delegates. You have been uh, the true uh, reason why we keep on and on. And it's such a uh, humbling experience to have all the compliments that you shower on us. Uh, so uh, a week uh, uh, we need to wind up today's session
but uh, we are going to continue now we are going to go on to another field a newer field artificial intelligence in neonatology we have three talks lined up in the row the first one is going to be on 22nd of uh, this month and then uh, on 8th march we are taking a deviation from that and we are going to have professor sida shankaran's talk on updates and controversies in cooling uh, which was a talk that was due some time ago. We are going to have it at that time. And then we will continue with artificial intelligence with the authority on uh, artificial intelligence, Professor Carolyn McGregor. Uh, subsequently, that will be the second talk. And then we'll have Professor Eugene Dempsey and the authorities who are doing. So these are a few talks lined up for regarding that topic is concerned. So uh, let me thank all of you for having joined us today. And then let me invite you uh, for the future talks as well. Thank you so much. Good day, good morning, good evening, good night.